screen as well. So, Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 14. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth, it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch, because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed." I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him for the meaning of this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favour of the holy people of the Most High and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation... The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. I don't know about you, but it seems to me there's a lot of rage about at the moment. A lot of anger we can see nations raging against one another. We just have to turn on our news programs, don't we? Uh, How two years ago, the Russians invade Ukraine. And the rage and the anger that that causes, and that comes from. And then there's Hamas kind of coming into Israel and uh, killing people and taking hostages. And then Israel's response of rage. And more recently, of course, Lebanon, Hezbollah involved And those are just two examples of nations raging against one another. But it's also true, as we look around the world, that nations rage against God's 
people, and there are hundreds of examples. Just think of North Korea, where, where to be a Christian, the, the best you can hope for is imprisonment in a labor camp, and perhaps worse, in Central Africa. Boko Haram and other Islamist groups are coming in, they're killing Christians, they're, they're kidnapping children, and individuals themselves so often rage against the Christian faith. Just look at YouTube and, and some of the atheists on there and, and the rage they express in their videos. And perhaps for you, it's friends of yours or colleagues at work who have a rage against your faith. Or perhaps it's even people in your family. And if you told them, if they thought about you coming to church, that would make them angry. There's a lot of rage about in the, the Lord of the Rings, in the, in the second book or the second movie, if you've only seen the movies, there's King Theoden of the Rohirrim, and he's facing an army of 10,000 rampaging orcs looking to come and to destroy. And he says, how shall any tower withstand such numbers and such reckless hate? Maybe with him we would want to say this morning, how can we withstand such reckless hate? What do we do? How can we stand? How can we even go forward with all of this going on round about us? And it's not just about direct opposition that we might experience. I think we all know, don't we, that life can be hard. It can be really tough at times. There are all kinds of challenges that face us every day, every week. Each of us has a, a whole host of things that, that can bring us down. What is our hope? Well, I want to say this morning, as we look at this chapter in Daniel, and you, as it was read, you may have th thought, what on earth has it got to do with us this morning? But there is hope in this chapter. Whether you're trusting in Christ or not, there is hope amidst the rage. So turn back to Daniel chapter 7. We're now 50 years or so since Daniel himself, as a young teenager was taken, and if you like, kidnapped from his home in Jerusalem and taken with others from Israel to a foreign and pagan land. And Daniel would have very good reasons to despair in that situation. Not only has his home city, Jerusalem, been invaded, it's now been laid waste. And even worse, the holy temple has been destroyed. That place that was the center of, and focus of the worship of the one true God, the place where, where sacrifices were made so that sins could be forgiven, where, where God lived among his people. He could easily have thought, where is God? But he has stood firm. We've seen it over the last several weeks. He has remained faithful to God, and he's even been promoted within the government. He's now a senior government official. And we've seen... King Nebuchadnezzar become someone who originally knew nothing of God to be someone who acknowledges the one true God and perhaps even believes and trusts in God. But now there is a new king, Belshazzar, on the throne. And Daniel knows this new king is a wicked, cruel, and utterly pagan king. Daniel chapter 7, it's actually set before the events of Daniel chapter 5. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Remember the, the writing on the wall and the night that Belshazzar was slain. This chapter comes before that in, in the history. So with this new pagan king now coming in, surely Daniel now has reasons to despair. And it's into this situation that God gives him this dream, this, this vision at night. And it comes as a message to encourage him, to give him hope for the future, gives him reasons to stand firm. And the message of his vision is in the Bible, it's God's word written for us, so that we this morning, a lot later, two and a half thousand years later, we can be encouraged. We can have hope now and for the future, that we can stand. Now, I don't know about you, whether you have weird dreams. I won't tell you any of my dreams, they're probably too weird to express. But we have weird dreams sometimes. But this dream is really weird. I get you got that as we read it through, didn't you? What on earth does it mean? Well, thankfully, the chapter tells us what it means. The main message is quite simple. It's there in verse 17 to 18. The four great beasts 
are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So the first thing we see from this dream is that beastly kings rule. Daniel sees these four beasts emerging from the raging sea. And, and, and this is the kind of uh, text in the Bible that when it's read, when you read it, you need to picture it in your mind. Treat it like a picture book and imagine these things in your mind. Picture them, draw them in your mind. Picture a stormy ocean with, with huge waves rising up as the winds batter. And from this raging sea, we observe the beasts emerging. Great, terrifying beasts. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked, and there, there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea, and four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. And the first it is, is like a lion, except it has eagle's wings, until its wings are torn off, and it changes into a human being. It's, it's given the mind of a man. The second beast is like a great bear, strong and, and, and vigorous. And this bear has gone round and killing its prey so much so that three of the ribs of its prey are stuck in its teeth. Can you imagine that? This is not a chicken bone. It's ribs stuck in its teeth. And the third is, is like a leopard and the leopard with four wings, a speedy, voracious predator. It has four heads. It can see, it can observe, it dominates every direction of the compass. And if that wasn't bad enough, the fourth beast is, Daniel says, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. And can't be compared with any earthly creature. It's more powerful, much stronger, more frightening than any of the first three. And it crushes and devours its victims with its iron teeth and bronze claws and tramples the broken remains of its prey underfoot until it's completely destroyed. What does this vision mean? We've seen already Daniel's been told the basic meaning of the vision. These four kings are maybe kings or kingdoms, are earthly kingdoms with powerful rulers who will come in, in, in Daniel's time. And now we're going to have a very brief history lesson. If you don't like history, don't worry, it's very brief. And it also has pictures. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to keep up while we very briefly look at the history of the period. In 605 BC, there's King Nebuchadnezzar. In 605, he conquers Jerusalem. And he takes Daniel and the others into exile. And the Babylonian Empire that you can see there as that, as that moon shape rules over the western part of the Middle East. Meanwhile, beyond Babylon, there's a kingdom called Media. And in 550 BC, a man called Cyrus, who is king of Persia, through conquest of other nations, he is announced to be the king of kings of the Achaemenid Empire, which includes Media until in 539 BC, he conquers the Babylonian Empire, which we read about in Daniel chapter 5. And now King Cyrus rules over the Persian Empire, sometimes called Medo-Persia, or the Achaemenid Persian Empire, normally just called Persia. And at its height, it extends, as you can see, even into Eastern Europe, a mighty empire. But 200 years later... In 334 BC, a man called Alexander the Great, who is the king of Macedon in Greece, he invades the Persian Empire and he overthrows the whole empire in a 10-year campaign that extends even into North India. But he dies a young man at the age of 32 in 323 BC. And after his death, that mighty kingdom is divided into four smaller kingdoms. It includes the Ptolemies in Egypt. So if you think about Cleopatra, you've all heard of Cleopatra. She was a Ptolemy or Ptolemaic. And also the Seleucid kingdom, which is that larger area, the largest part of the original Greek empire. And Jerusalem and Israel, as you can see, are caught in between Egypt and the Seleucid 
kingdoms, like in being in the meat grinder. They're caught right in the middle. And that's described, that period is described in great detail in, in Daniel 11, that we'll have the privilege of looking at in a few weeks. It's a great story of kings and princesses, recognized as really accurate portrayal of what happens in history. Letitia did ancient history at university, and one of the lecturers, not a Christian, he, he, he would refer to the book of Daniel because it accurately portrays what took place. Although, obviously, he would deny its prophetical value. We would say that in, you know, 600 years before, uh, or, or, you know, 300 years before these things happened, that, that Daniel sees them in a vision. And particularly, there's a guy called Antiochus Epiphanes, depicted there, one of the statues of him. And, and he particularly oppresses the Judah and the Israelites. And he persecutes the Jewish religion. And he tries to change the set times and the laws. He, he desecrates the temple. And these kingdoms, this kingdom lasts until in about 63 BC, uh, the Roman invasion happens and, and Rome, the Roman Empire is established. So that's the brief history lesson. So if you don't like history, you can now switch back on. Now, within that historical context, these four kings of Daniel's dream have been interpreted in, in various ways. Uh, the first is universally recognized, the lion, as being Nebuchadnezzar. He's, 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 a, he's a lion with eagle's wings, but he turns into a human being, which refers back to chapter 4, when... Remember, in his pride, he was cast down and, and, and acted like, a, like an animal, like a browsing animal. And, and God restored him, and he praised God, and he, he becomes once more a human being. After that, there's disagreement as to what the other three kings refer to. Traditionally, have been identified as, as Persia, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. But more recently, a favoured view is that they refer to Media, which is the empire beyond Babylon, and Persia, which is then the new empire that, that Cyrus comes and conquers, and the Greek empire of Alexander the Great, and the, the four kingdoms that follow. It's worth saying, these, these four beasts that Daniel sees, it's not an exhaustive list, not a complete list of all of the world powers, even at Daniel's time. Rather, think of it from Daniel's point of view, it's describing history and how it's going to play out from Daniel's point of view into the future, and particularly how it would affect the people of God. Our viewpoint on this is the past. All these things have come to pass already. So we have to ask first, why are these kingdoms depicted as beasts? Why beasts? These kingdoms are seen and portrayed as dangerous wild beasts because they behave like beasts. They are brutal carnivores, hunting their prey and tearing their enemies limb from limb. They're depicted as beasts because they are, as it were, no longer human. They're not what humanity is meant to be. How humanity was, we were created in God's image to show people what God is like, and these beasts are no longer human. Their behavior is ungodly. They're godless kingdoms. They're wild beasts. They're terrifying. They're powerful. And they're destructive. And they emerge from the sea. And throughout the Bible, you'll see the sea because in, uh, depicted in this way because especially in ancient times, the sea was a dangerous place. If a storm came up and you were out of sight of the shore, your life was in danger. The world is frightening and dangerous when people reject God's rule. And from this chaos, this godless chaos, emerge kingdoms in opposition to God. And if the immediate meaning is of four ancient kingdoms that no longer exist, it can also be said to be true of many kingdoms and governments throughout history and even today. Our world is a world in turmoil because it rejects God. 
from this godless turmoil, godless and wicked rulers and nations emerge to terrify and to destroy, and especially to destroy God's people. Nations who are against God are also against his people. And the fourth beast is especially terrible because of its oppression of God's people. The little horn that emerges from the ten horns is probably referring to Antiochus Epiphanes, whose head statue we saw earlier. Look at verse 21. As I watched, this horn, this little horn, was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. Verse 25, he will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. This is a description of reality on the earth. It has happened in the past. It is happening now, and it will continue to happen. God's people will suffer at the hands of God's enemies. The reality seems to be that these beastly kings, they rule unopposed. And that's why Daniel is so upset by this dream. Verse 28, he says, this is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale. Why does God show Daniel this frightening vision, this terrifying vision? Why? Well, first of all, he wants to prepare God's people for suffering, that we should not be surprised when nations or people rage against God. Jesus himself said to his disciples, he said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Be prepared to be raged against, to suffer. But now, as the, he sees the fourth beast on its destructive rampage, Daniel sees something else. It's as if his eyes are lifted from the earth up into heaven. And he sees a courtroom, a place of judgment. And he sees the judge taking his seat. Verse 9, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. You see, if beastly kings rule... It's true also the eternal one judges. The eternal one judges. This judge on the throne, he is the ancient of days. His hair and his clothing, white like wool, they show his wisdom and his purity. His throne is wreathed in flame. There is fire of judgment flowing from his throne. And he's attended by millions upon millions of witnesses to his judgment, to see his judgment is pure and just and right, just as he is. Who is this who sits on the throne of judgment? It is the Ancient of Days, the Eternal One. It is God Almighty who sits there. Our Heavenly King is the judge. And it may seem that beastly kings rule unopposed, but... The book of Daniel, really, the message of the book of Daniel is that appearances can be deceptive. Appearances can be deceptive. Who has true power in the world? Is it whoever wins the election this week in America? Is it that, the guy with the largest army? Is it the biggest bully? Is it the most evil dictator? No, God reigns. He is the one who is in power. And he rules over this world as its judge. And what is his judgment? 
Daniel says, verse 11, I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts have been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. This fourth beast, this powerful, rampaging, terrifying, unstoppable creature of destruction is slain, is destroyed, is thrown into a blazing fire. Because the eternal one judges. First of all, beastly kings rule only as God allows. That's in verse 12. Beastly kings only rule as God permits them to do so. And secondly, beastly kingdoms will be overthrown. You see, true reality, real reality, isn't just the things that you can see with your eyes. Of course, it includes those things. This world is a real place. It's not a simulation that we're living in. Beasts are real. Suffering is real. But you can only fully understand true reality when you recognize that God is ruling on the throne. The fourth terrifying beastly kingdom is overthrown by this judge. But what happens next, I think, is a real surprise. And it's down there in verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His kingdom is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You see, God destroys beastly kings and replaces them with a human king. That's what son of man means. It just means human being. And this human king is given an everlasting dominion. He is to rule over all nations, all peoples, every language. His kingdom is everlasting. It can never be destroyed. But who is this king? What human being is given an everlasting kingdom? Well, 550 years later, an angel comes to Mary to announce the birth of a boy. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you ought to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The son of man in Daniel's vision, he is the Messiah that the Jews waited for. He is Jesus. Jesus himself repeatedly calls himself the son of man when he, when he goes around Galilee and so on teaching. And that is because Jesus is the perfect man. He is the true image of God. He is, there is nothing of the beast about him. And Jesus grew up, of course. He died on a cross, as we've just remembered. And on the third day, he rose again. And then he ascended into heaven through the clouds and is now ruling at God's right hand. And more than 500 years before Jesus is even born, Daniel sees a vision of the risen and ascended Lord Jesus being given all authority Sovereign power being granted rule over everything as a human king in heaven. Beastly kings rule. The eternal one judges. And he set up an everlasting kingdom with a human king. But then there's a puzzle in the chapter. I don't know if you spotted it when it was read through. There is a puzzle. Clearly God gives Jesus the kingdom. We know that. But when someone explains the dream to Daniel, this is what he says, verse 18. He says, the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. What's going on? Whose kingdom is it anyway? Is it Jesus' kingdom? 
Or is it the kingdom of God's holy people? Who does it belong to? Well, the answer is both. Because God's people possess an everlasting kingdom. The holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Who are the God's holy people? Who are the saints? Because that's what holy is. Holy means someone who is set apart, someone who is special. But you'll be pleased to know it doesn't mean some special class of the super spiritual Christians who can do special things. The Bible is clear that all believers in Christ are holy people. We are all saints. So we can talk about Saint Summer and Saint Brian and Saint Carol and put your own name there. If you're trusting in Christ, you are a saint. You are sanctified, made holy by faith in Christ. And Daniel's dream tells us not just that Jesus rules as king, but that God's holy people, Christians, that we possess the kingdom. It's repeated again at the end, verse 26. But the court will sit and his power, that's the power of the little horn and the fourth beast, will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven, in other words, the whole earth, will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. God's people will possess the earth. And then it says his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. You see, both things are true. It is both his kingdom, it is Jesus' kingdom, He is the king, and that this kingdom belongs to God's people. Now, as Daniel has this vision, God is showing him the future, what will happen as like a single event. Like if you're out rambling, or perhaps in the hiking in in the mountains, and you think, oh, my destination is just there. But you don't realize you've got to come up another hill, and then you think, oh, there are three more hills to go over. It's called foreshortening. So Daniel sees it all foreshortened. But now we can look back and see it's not quite that simple. You see, God's everlasting kingdom did come in. Jesus was given the kingdom with when he came the first time. When he ascended into heaven, he was made king. But now we are living in what we call the now and the not yet of the kingdom. There are things that are true now and things that are not yet true. The kingdom has come. It is here now. But we are still waiting for Jesus to appear when he will complete the kingdom and make it perfect. That is the not yet. So our possession of the kingdom is not just for the future, which we might think of and accept, yes, I know, in the future, but it's true now. But Jonathan, you might say, it doesn't look like we possess very much. We don't possess the kingdom right now, surely. Surely it's Elon Musk and earthly governments who possess the earth, don't they? Well, let's listen to what Jesus said before he went into heaven. In Matthew 28, a familiar verse. You're, you're, if you've been here very long, you'll know this verse. He says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's been given all authority in the whole earth. Jesus is king. And what Daniel has seen in the dream is this. It is Jesus in heaven ruling as king. And we read then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. His enemies are still around. He's putting them under his feet. You see, the fourth beast has been destroyed. But the other beasts were merely stripped of their power and allowed to live for a while. But Jesus is reigning in heaven, putting all his enemies under his feet. But how is he doing that? How is he defeating his enemies right now? This might come as a surprise to you. Jesus is doing that through his people, through you and me, through the church. We read in the book of Revelation how Jesus purchased, he bought his people 
and that's you and me, to reign on the earth. And we do that through his word. We, his people, we rule the world through the word of Jesus. We do that by living, trusting in Jesus according to his word, following his word, not the ways of the world. We don't bow to that kingdom. We bow to the kingdom of Jesus. That is how we rule, by living in faith. And we rule by proclaiming his word, by being his witnesses, by telling people the good news of Jesus and by bringing them to, into the kingdom through repentance and faith. Jesus rules as God rules through what he says, through his word, but he has entrusted that to us, to his people, to the church, who he has made a royal priesthood. When Jesus spoke to his disciples before he went into heaven, we read the first part earlier. This is what he said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am the king, he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus uses his newfound authority to send us out, his disciples, as ambassadors with his authority. We have his authority as an ambassador, has the authority of the nation that sends it. And we are to conquer all nations, not with the sword, but by making disciples with the word. And that's how Jesus is putting his enemies under his feet, as his church makes disciples, as he brings, his church brings the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Just think of one example. Christian missionaries were thrown out of China when there was the Cultural Revolution because the government didn't want Christianity in the country. And they thought they'd won. You know, we're supreme, aren't we? We're the Chinese government. We're the Communist Party. We've won. Christianity's gone. And many Western missionaries feared for the church. But what's happened? Since then, the church in China has grown. The everlasting kingdom of Jesus has grown. Jesus is winning as his people make disciples. We possess the kingdom now by living out the gospel, by showing and telling all people the good news of the kingdom. But possessing a kingdom in this way is not easy, is it? It's not glamorous. It's not cushy. Our rule will often look like defeat at times. We may face considerable suffering and opposition. As Daniel was told, his people would suffer but what did, the, what did the man say to Daniel? It's only for a limited time. God's people will suffer for time, times, and half a time. It's just three and a half times, like maybe, I don't know, three and a half years. It's a limited time. It's a short time. So we possess the kingdom by taking up our cross and following Jesus. Nations and people still rage against God and his people. But it's only for a limited time, a short time. We possess the kingdom now by making disciples, by bringing others into the kingdom. That's because Jesus is the king ruling at his father's right hand with all power and all authority. And so we look forward and we wait for that glorious day when Jesus will appear. And all his enemies will finally be defeated. And he will bring in the final perfection and completion of his kingdom. And on that day, which is not yet, we will share with Jesus in this eternal, everlasting kingdom. This is our inheritance with Jesus from God the Father. So as we look forward, we live our lives looking forward as Christians. We're waiting for that day. As we do that, we stand firm. And we're to exercise the rule of Jesus by proclaiming his word and living under his word. Maybe there are lots of things that you, want to, that you worry about the future. There are lots of things that we could worry about, aren't there? 
lots of struggles that we face, that our families face, that our countries face. The world can be a terrible place. Suffering and evil are real. But let's remember two things. First of all, Jesus rules. He has all the authority, all the glory, all the sovereign power, and one day all nations will worship him. Beastly kings may still rule, but only as God allows, and they do face judgment and destruction. But secondly, let's remember that as God's people, we possess the kingdom as we're to make disciples by proclaiming his word. And we look forward to sharing in his inheritance, the inheritance with Jesus because we are his brothers and his sisters. As Christians, we're trusting in Christ. We we look to Jesus, he's ruling. And although he allows evil at present time, he will overthrow it. We possess an everlasting kingdom. There is hope amidst the rage if you're a Christian this morning. But if you're not a Christian, There is still hope. The same hope that we have is held out for all of those if you will put your trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's you this morning. You feel you have no hope for the future, but the king calls on you graciously, lovingly, to put your trust in him, to come to him. I wonder, will you do that? Will you repent of your rebellion against God and believe in Jesus Christ? and enter his kingdom. And then you too can know this hope that we have, even amidst the rage of this world. Beastly kings rule, the eternal one judges, and God's people possess an everlasting kingdom.